Yes, uh, my name is Sada Bourgeois and I am a PhD student at the University of Coimbra. I also have a second university in Sheffield in the UK and uh, my field of research is solar physics. More specifically, my PhD project is about solar feature identification. For that, I use an image processing method, um, which is called math mathematical morphology. I cannot um, go to the next slide. They call the slide. Ah, yes, okay. Um, yes, so first I will introduce this uh, mathematical morphology image processing method and how it can be applied to the field of space weather. And then we will see that um, we also have uh, many other applications of this uh, mathematical morphology method in many different sectors like uh, farming, construction, or for example, the medical sector. So, so mathematical morphology is a theory for image analysis. It's quite an old technique now, as it has first been conceived in the 1960s by Georges Mathurin and Jean Serra. Basically, it is used to describe objects in images based on their shapes. So each uh, mathematical morphology operation takes as input at least two inputs, the original image and another object that we call, uh, that we call a structuring element. And this object plays the role of a mask of a kernel that slides across the entire original image. And uh, this allows us to filter the image, to remove some unwanted features, or, or to highlight some important features. And uh, all this uh, filtering process, it depends on our choice for the shape of uh, the structuring element, and also our choice for its size and for its orientation. And here on this picture, we can see the two basic mathematical morphology operations, the dilation and the erosion. Uh, first, the dilation, we can see it uh, on the middle picture. So here, they use a disc-shaped stocking element to expand the image, to dilate the image. And on the right hand side, they use the same disc-shaped stocking element, but this time to shrink the object. And this is um, what we call an erosion operation. So I won't get too much into the details, but these both operations, dilation and erosion, they form the basis for more complex and advanced uh, mathematical morphology operations and algorithms. And we have many applications of this method, like for example, noise filtering, as we can see in picture B and uh, also the enhancement of object structures, like we can see in picture A, or the enhancement of object contours, like um, edge detection. Also, mathematical morphology can be applied to segmentation problems in images, uh, like for example, for facial recognition or text segmentation, like we can see in picture D. And it can also provide us with some quantitative description about these features, like, for example, uh, the area or the perimeter of these features or any other shape descriptors. This method has uh, many benefits um, because it can be applied to many different types of image data. It's also very efficient to highlight important features, um, even if they have complex shapes or irregular shapes. Uh, it's also, um, it also has a broad applicability because it can be applicable to both binary and grayscale images and also to low resolution and high, high resolution image data. For example, here we can see on the middle picture, we can see a solar image recorded at the observatory of Wimbra. And on the right hand side, we can see uh, higher, much higher resolution images taken by uh, the, the SDO satellite. The, yeah, the SDO satellite. And um, uh, so what we do with these images, we look for tiny dark dots that we call sunspots. We will see later what are sunspots. And um, here, what we can see is that on the left image, the algorithms manage to correctly identify the sunspot in spite of the bad weather condition effects appearing on this image. Because uh, this image uh, is from a ground-based observatory, so it's affected by uh, bad weather condition effects. Like we can see here, these long stripes, uh, this is because of the clouds and rain uh, on the picture. 
And also another advantage of this method is that um, we can customize it in many ways. We can try to choose um, the optimal parameters and uh, the best suitable operations. So we can play around with many different parameters with uh, the size, the, the shape and orientation, for example. But actually, it can also be a, a drawback sometimes because um, it can be it can be very time consuming and long to find the optimal operations and parameters because it's a trial and error process. And for now, there is no way to uh, automatically find these optimal operations, um, uh, except maybe there are some um, some recent attempts nowadays with artificial intelligence, but um, for now, it's not straightforward. But once we have found the optimal operations and parameters, then we can apply this magnetic morphology method in an automated way. And also, this method is not applicable if the features do not share a common pattern. Or like, um, for example, I don't know if we want to distinguish between trees and buildings on an image, and um, if they have the, the same size and shape and directionality, then uh, the method won't be able to detect, to, to discriminate between these both features. Uh, but here on this picture, we can see that it's very straightforward because all these objects have different size and shapes. So for example, here we extract object B because it's the only object that can contain the disc-shaped structuring element. But uh, if we want to extract object C, then we could use, for example, a line-shaped structuring element. So now I will talk about um, the application of this magnetic morphology method to space weather. So first I will introduce what is space weather and um, also why it is important to forecast and to monitor space weather. So here I put two definitions of space weather. The first one is an American definition. And the second one, an European definition, uh, maybe because they thought that the uh, American definition is a bit too pessimistic. But um, basically, space weather, it, um, it describes the general interactions between the sun and Earth and its magnetic field. Because the sun is not static, it experiences a constant activity all the time, and it constantly sends out a flow of charged particles into the interplanetary space which is called solar wind, this flow of charged particles. And on top of this solar wind, sometimes we also have solar eruptions. And uh, if these solar eruptions are directed towards Earth, then uh, this can have uh, consequences for us, at least for our, for our activities. Um, for example, our, our activities in space, because they can damage satellites. They also can be afraid for astronauts. And um, they can also have an impact on the atmosphere because they can disrupt the radio communications. And also the aircraft passengers who are traveling around the poles, uh, they may be exposed to elevated radiation during a solar eruption. And uh, finally, they may even have an effect on the ground because they can uh, induce electric currents that may damage the power grids. And one of the first observations of a solar eruption, of a strong solar eruption, it was uh, recorded in 1859 by Carrington and Oxen. And it was actually what we call a solar flare, which is a massive burst of electromagnetic radiation. So since it's electromagnetic radiation, it uh, travels at the speed of light. So it reached the Earth um, in eight minutes and it has caused a geometric storm that was so intense that uh, back then telegraph systems caught fire, they were damaged, and also people could see auroras even in Panama. So yeah, it was a very strong event, um, but we have uh, other significant space of events, like for example, in 1872, um, the government lines between Britain and India uh, were blocked for hours because the solar storm affected the British Indian uh, submarine cable. Also, in 1967, a war almost broke out because of a solar storm. The US government thought that uh, the Soviets had jammed their radio communications, so they were ready to prepare an airstrike. But um, 
an airstrike, airstrike. <laughs> But um, yeah, fortunately, there were already uh, space weather forecasters at that time, so they warned them just in time. And so, another striking event, it was in 1972 in Vietnam, and um, actually, this solar eruption saved Vietnamese boats during the Vietnam War because um, the US sea mines detonated earlier than expected because um, these are magnetic sea mines, so they reacted to the magnetism brought along uh, with a solar eruption coming to the Earth. Also in 1989, there was a total blackout in Quebec and Canada, so people stayed in the dark for several hours. In April 2001, there were very powerful auroras that could be almost everywhere on Earth. And actually, my parents saw them uh, in the middle of France at 1 a.m. It was very bright, like um, like it was playing the light at 1 a.m. And then another very important event also, uh, we can see here in the picture, it happened in July 2012. And it was not directed towards Earth, but it was one of the strongest uh, solar eruption recorded. And, and um, Yes, it's quite terrifying because uh, we don't know what could have been the consequences for us on Earth if it had hit the Earth. And also, um, more recently, in February 2022, um, the SpaceX company lost almost 40 satellites just uh, one day after the launch. And this was also due to a solar storm. It was even not a big solar storm, only a moderate event, but it was enough to increase the atmospheric drag, and so they, they lost um, these satellites. So we have many other examples like this, but um, we can see that um, space weather can affect many, many different sectors. And since we are more and more dependent on our space and ground-based technologies, we really need space weather forecasting. So now I will go a bit more into details about these solar eruptions. First, we have these corner mass ejections, which are massive bursts of uh, magnetized plasma ejected by the sun. Typically, a corner mass ejection can contain 10 to 16 grams of matter. It has a speed of 300 kilometers per second up to 3000 kilometers per second during more active times, which corresponds to 10 million kilometers per hour. And um, depending on the solar conditions, uh, a corner mass ejection can take one to four days to reach the Earth. Also, they can originate from both the quiet sun and from more active regions of the sun, where we have um, strong concentrations of magnetic field. And when they originate from these active regions, uh, usually they also are faster. And um, here on this uh, blue picture, we can see that um, often, uh, I mean, sometimes we can see uh, this, um, this type of structure, uh, this type of uh, three-part morphology structure for corner mass ejection. Uh, so we have this bright frontal loop, followed by a dark cavity underneath and below the bright core. And um, here we can see it very well because the instrument that took this picture, it's called a coronograph. So it, it hides the sun uh, with this uh, blue disc here at the center. It hides the sun so we can see the outer atmosphere that we call the corona. So thanks to this instrument, we can see the corona. And actually, the sun is this uh, tiny little white circle here in the middle. So we can see how big a corona mass ejection can be in comparison to the sun. Uh, but we don't always have these three-part morphology structures. Uh, we also have other structures. And um, sometimes, we also have halo corona mass ejections, like we can see on the second pictures. And um, these ones can be very destructive because um, they go, they can go in every direction. So eventually they reach Earth also. And uh, when we speak of solar emissions, we also think of solar flares, which are massive bursts of electromagnetic radiation, uh, which is caused by a huge release of magnetic energy from the sun. And solar flares, they only originate from active regions, contrary to corner mass ejection uh, that can also originate from the quiet sun. 
And um, when they are not associated with corneal mastication, they are called confined flares. Otherwise, when they are associated uh, with these corneal mass ejections, they are called eruptive flares. And these ones are the most important for space weather, can be very powerful. And also we can see that uh, solar flares can be very energetic. They can be up to 10 to 32, 10 to 33 X, which corresponds to the annual electricity consumptions of uh, quad quadrillion households, so 10 to 15 households. And on the other side, not like stars, they even have discovered super flares that can be 1,000 times stronger than uh, the Carrington event. And uh, it's, not, we are, it's not clear yet if uh, these super flares can happen or not. Or not. And um, to all these uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections, they are linked to magnetic structures at the surface of the sun that we call the photosphere. So on the photosphere, we have um, we have uh, quiet regions like we can see uh, on the left. It looks static, but actually it's not static at all. We have uh, convection cells in constant motion. This is what we call granulation. And uh, we also have more active regions where we have much stronger magnetic fields. And inside these active regions, we have sunspots where the magnetic field uh, can reach several thousands of cows. Uh, by comparison, I think that a strong refrigerator magnet has a magnetic field of about 100 cows. And here in the middle picture, we can see a zoom in on a part of the photosphere where we can see um, we can see that uh, some sunspots are much larger than the size of the Earth itself. So they look very tiny on the solar images, but actually uh, they can be very large, much larger than the Earth. And on the last picture, we can see that a sunspot consists of a dark umber, and uh, it's surrounded by a lighter pennon power wand. And uh, the umber looks even darker because it's, uh, it's a bit colder due to the high concentrations of magnetic field uh, that inhibit the, the convective motions of granulation. So yes, so this is where we can see flares and, uh, and fast corner mass ejections. This is around these active regions and sunspots. So it's important to follow the evolution and to understand the evolution of these active regions. So we need automated detection of these active regions. And actually we need automated detection of um, any relevant solar features that can help us um, in space weather forecasting. And uh, we need automated detection because there are some limitations to manual extraction as it can be time consuming and um, it can be also a bit subjective. Also, we now have more and more data, especially with the advent of spatial observatories. So it's more complicated to do manual extraction. And uh, also with more automated tools, it can be easy to it can be easier to generalize our algorithms to data coming from different sources, like for example, uh, data coming from ground-based observatories and uh, data coming from space-borne observatories. And regarding um, automated sunspot detection, there have been already a lot of studies carried out on this subject, like um, threshold methods. Or, for example, we also have a um, detection method based on artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning techniques. But here in this work, we focus on uh, mathematical morphology. So here um, we have some examples of what we can do with, math with mathematical morphology to identify these sunspots. So, we can see here that uh, we identified sunspots on different uh, types of images. The first one is an image on the left. Uh, it's an image recorded uh, at the observatory of Coimbra. Uh, the picture in the middle is uh, an image recorded at the observatory of Catania in Italy. And the last one is a satellite image with much higher resolution, uh, which has been taken by uh, the STO satellites. So what we do is that uh, we pinpoint these sunspots over several years and uh, on several uh, image data. 
And we can see that visually the contouring of these features looks fine, but we also want to validate this mathematical morphology method in a more quantitative way. So for that, we measure the sunspot areas that are defined inside the contours that we have found with mathematical morphology. And then we correct these uh, sunspot areas for the foreshortening effect, because when we project uh, the, the sun, the 3D sun, onto a plane image, then we will have projection effects appearing, like, um, for example, um, the sunspots near the solar limb, they will appear smaller than they actually are. So we need to take into account this foreshortening effect. And then we have compared our sunspot area measurements, our corrected sunspot area measurements, with two other standard reference sunspot catalogs. The first one is uh, the THO catalog, and it's based on satellite data on SDO satellite data, and second one, Mandal et al., it's based on data crossing from different ground-based observatories. And um, here, this is what we obtain when we compare our data with the two other catalogs in terms of corrected sunspot areas. And um, we have here the correlation coefficients between these three sunspot records on the, on the right. And we can spot some slight differences in all these sunspot records, and even between the two standard catalogs, THO and Madaletol. And this is because uh, we have uh, different recording means and different facilities, also different data processing techniques and different sync uh, conditions, because um, Madaletol's uh, data uses um, ground-based observatory data, while uh, uh, our data and uh, the THO use um, the SDO satellite data. But overall, we can see that uh, we obtain a good correlation. So this uh, validates uh, this mathematical morphology method quantitatively. And now we can try to, to adapt it, this method and to apply it to the identification of basically almost any solar feature as long as these features share a similar kind of shape or a similar pattern. For example, here on the right, uh, we have identified uh, solar faculty. Uh, this is again um, a solar image recorded at the observatory of Coimbra. And uh, yes, we can see a faculty, these uh, bright regions of strong magnetic fields. And uh, also, uh, mathematical morphology can be applied to simulation data, which is interesting because it's a very different type of image, of image data. And for example, we have extracted um, flux rope structures. Uh, flux ropes are twisted structures in the early phase of coronal mass ejections. So here we have uh, extracted these flux rope structures from simulation generated twist normal maps. So I won't get too much into the details, but uh, we can see on the left an example of a simulation map, and we can see the outlines of the flux ropes. And uh, then on the second image, we proceed to the extraction of this flux rope with uh, mathematical morphology algorithms. And then if we proceed to this extraction on many time frames, then we can model the magnetic field lines of this uh, active region, and we can follow the evolution of the flux of root points, which can be very important uh, because flux hops can lead to, to corner mass ejections. And another application also um, is um, we also can use mathematical morphology to detect coronal of limb structures. That means that uh, these structures are very far from the sun. They are in the corona, in the outer atmosphere. So here again, we have used um, SDO satellite image data, this time with another channel. And uh, basically, we extracted um, every coronal features that we could see on these images. And uh, we did that from 2010 to 2021 with a cadence of three hours. So it's a lot of data. It's like uh, almost 1 million features. But then it can be interesting because um, we can we can obtain some properties of these um, features. Like for example, we can get the area of the intensity of the center coordinates of these features, and then we can we can have some we can make some statistics on these properties. 
so here, for example, we have plotted uh, the solar latitude as a function of time, and uh, the, color, the color coding indicates intensity. So we can see that uh, we have um, structures with high intensity around the mid latitudes and close to the equator. Also, we can see that we have um, more intense activity around the solar cycle maximum in 2014 when we have um, intense magnetic activity and it's often related also to more frequent and uh, more intense solar eruptions. But we also have uh, important features uh, that are not um, that have a lower intensity. Like, for example, we have uh, this medium intensity uh, long structures here that are washing to the poles. Uh, we, we, call that the, uh, we call these structures polar jets. And uh, yes, we can see them disappearing after the solar cycle maximum. But they can also be interesting for space weather forecasting. So yeah, these are just some examples of uh, solar feature identification with uh, mathematical morphology. But uh, actually, this method can be applied to basically almost any field of research that needs image processing, not only solar physics. And uh, for example, it can be used to detect uh, potholes, which are uh, world defects. So they can be dangerous for road users. So road monitoring is needed, and especially automated road monitoring, because uh, manual checking is time consuming, costly, and sometimes also uh, a bit less accurate. So here in this paper in uh, Musli Metal, uh, they have developed mathematical morphology algorithms to count and to detect potholes. And uh, they have used uh, digital videos. Uh, these videos are just uh, taken from a camera, put, put on a car and moving in the city. And here on the left binary image, we can see an example of a pothole identification with uh, mathematical morphology. And then we can see, we can follow uh, the tracking of this pothole on successive images. And um, yes, so we also have to do, I mean, it was also a lot of trial and error for them to find the optimal uh, mathematical morphology parameters. But then they obtained very good results in the uh, in the protocol identification with this method. And then we can also apply mathematical morphology to enhance images. Uh, this is particularly needed in the medical sector, for example, as medical images are often noisy and with a poor contrast quality. Uh, this is due to several factors, but um, for example, uh, this can be due to technical constraints of uh, imaging devices, or emergency situations. Also, the patient can have a special medical conditions that uh, degrades the picture quality, or, or even if the patient moves during the photography process. This can be a problem. So they want sharpened images, and uh, they want uh, they want to enhance uh, they want edge enhancement in order to better visualize the different organs and bones and to check if there are some uh, problems, like, for example, tumors. So here we can see an example in Firozetol. We can see on the left images, we can see the original medical images. And on the right, uh, we have the um, contrast in images produced by uh, mathematical morphology algorithms. So now we can use these uh, better contrast images for, uh, for better diagnosis. And then um, mathematical morphology can also be used uh, on, uh, on images of civil engineering materials, for example. Uh, so it depends on what we want to do. But for example, here on the left, we can see that uh, they want to segment a glass image. So they want to separate and to, to properly define each component in the image. And we can see the result here in picture D. Uh, we can see the segmented image. Or we have also another example of material image processing on the right, where they want to, to clean and fit out a cast iron image. So we can see that uh, they removed the small noise, they also removed um, the structures touching the image borders, and also they displayed the skeletons of these features, um, which is the inner structure of these features. 
And um, in Picurity, this is what we obtained. So yeah, we have, um, I mean, it has uh, various applications. It depends on what we want to do. But um, for example, here it can be interesting like uh, to check if some materials are damaged so they can replace them. Also, it can, uh, the method can also be applied to the detection of the C skyline. C sky this can be important, uh, for example, for target detection on the C, because it can help in, reduce, in reducing the calculation time of target detection. And um, it's not so trivial as it could look like, because as we can see in these images, we can have some problems um, with uh, visibility conditions, bad weather conditions, or also see uh, complex sea conditions, like uh, wave interferences. Or even we can also have changing background conditions, because, for example, if we have um, uh, mountains and background or ships, then this can also interfere with uh, good detection of the uh, sea skyline. But here, in this paper, we can see that um, um, the mathematical morphology method performed well in the detection of this sea skyline, and even better than other methods, like, for example, better than uh, uh, a simple Gaussian filter. Also, mathematical morphology can be coupled with artificial intelligence. So here, um, they have implemented a neural network with uh, mathematical morphology algorithms inside in order to remove the, the rain and the haze from images. So this can have various applications, uh, like, for example, uh, autonomous navigation or surveillance. And also, like we, can, like, uh, we saw earlier, it could also be applicable in the field of space weather because we have um, these images from ground-based observatories that are affected by bad weather condition effects. So they call this um, architecture a morphological neural network. And um, actually, it's one of the first implementation of a morphological neural network in Mandalay in 2020. So we can see that it's, it's very recent. And we can see that uh, they have obtained good quality results on the test images. Uh, we can see that in picture G, these are some examples of what they obtained when they apply the morphological new network to remove the rain. And we can see also that uh, it performs as good as a traditional conventional neural network, as we can see on picture E. Actually, maybe it even works a bit better because you can see that there is still some rain remaining on the images uh, processed by the convolutional neural network. And um, most importantly, uh, the morphological neural network is uh, much faster to compute as it has uh, far fewer parameters to learn. And um, also another interesting thing is that uh, it can provide some insights into the neural network uh, because uh, the parameters that must be learned by the neural network they are related to, to the mathematical morphology parameters, like the size and shape of the striking elements. So this can also provide us with some uh, topological and geometrical information about um, how the neural network is working. Because intuitively, we can understand how the image was processed in terms of geometrical operations. And um, usually it's some, something that we cannot know with a traditional neural network, uh, it's a bit like a black box and we don't know how it is uh, working. So it's an interesting application of uh, mathematical morphology coupled with artificial intelligence. And uh, now I will uh, present uh, some other applications, but uh, this time focused on um, satellite uh, image data, high resolution satellite images. So here in uh, Pina and Barata et al, uh, they have used uh, high resolution satellite images to um, to recognize and to monitor olive trees. So we can see that here again, they have applied a different uh, mathematical morphology algorithm in order to first segment the olive trees patches to separate them from the background. And then we can see uh, at, uh, on the bottom uh, that uh, they try to precisely identify each individual olive tree. And this can be very useful for crop monitoring and also for landscape preservation, for example. Um, yes. 
Also, regarding uh, urban planning and uh, disaster management, we need building extraction. So here in Gavin Caritol, they have extracted buildings with uh, mathematical morphology, uh, but uh, they also had some uh, false building extraction. So they decided to they decided to remove the false detected objects, uh, false detected buildings, by using some parameters like uh, the area of the detected object or the eccentricity or the ratio of a major axis or of a minor axis. And um, and yes, basically they removed all the detected objects that didn't fulfill these three conditions. And uh, then eventually uh, they get a very um, effective uh, extraction scheme. Also another application, um, we can also apply hematic morphology to the extraction of coastlines. Uh, this is this can be very important in the current context of erosion uh, because we need to to monitor the coastline uh, retreats for beach preservation. And here on the left, we can see an example of uh, this uh, coastline extraction with uh, mathematical morphology in uh, Rizikeza et al. And uh, in Pisan et al, we can see that uh, they also uh, they also do coastline extraction. Uh, this time using multispectral very high resolution images. And here they have uh, developed different mathematical morphology algorithms and um, different uh, parameters according to the type of coastlines that they want to extract. Like, um, for example, for now, they can uh, extract um, four different types of coastlines, sandy beaches, uh, dunes, cliffs, and uh, wetlands. And uh, here, uh, it's an example of a startup that uses mathematical morphology image processing. They also use deep learning techniques. So um, they provide uh, with uh, tools for image processing. And, um, and again, we have many, uh, many application areas like uh, ophthalmology, uh, life sciences, um, also quality inspection, and um, for example, also um, authenticity checking, like passport authenticity checking. And here in Portugal, we have GeoSat, which is um, one of the main uh, satellite operators and also one of the major operators in Europe. And uh, it's dedicated to Earth observation, and I think it, it has been implementing, implemented very recently uh, in 2021 with um, Pierre, the residence plan in Portugal. So they provide uh, in satellite image data that can be used in very different sectors like agriculture, infrastructures or defense, among others. And uh, they don't use mathematical morphology, but they also have a software for feature identification, because as we saw, this can be used by uh, many, many different sectors. So to conclude, I would say that uh, now we, we have so many data provided by the satellites that um, manual feature extraction is no longer feasible. We need automated image processing in order to highlight the uh, important features in images, because whatever the field of activity, this helps us in monitoring and uh, making decisions, and especially in the field of space weather, uh, because uh, we are more and more dependent on our technologies, and therefore we are much more vulnerable to solar eruptions nowadays. So we want to we want to make the most of this wealth of data at our disposal uh, to make a better space weather forecasting. So yes, that's it. Mom. Thank you very much for your attention. So does anyone have uh, any questions? Yes, Pedro. Hi, <laughs> Slava. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Very, very useful. Very nice. I have a, I have a question. If someone uh, would like to try these these uh, morphological mathematical algorithms 
and they have very little experience. You showed at the end this software called Apelian Dev. Uh, but would, if this if these people would have some experience in computation, so they they're familiar with Python or something like that, what would you say it's the best tool to try to deal with a new problem that maybe you wouldn't find in the literature from your experience? Um, you mean when you don't have any experience? You don't like, have experience in anything specific. You've never done research in solar physics or you've never done coastal imaging analysis, but you, you can program, you understand maths, but you just would like to, to think of a new application of this algorithm, maybe to detect, I don't know, uh, problems in, in, in painting of, of cars, you know, that there's something with the paint that make, leaves a spot and they're trying to find it like this. What would you, do you have any any idea of what would be the best tool to, to start an application like this? So it would have to be quite general, not specific. Uh, yeah, I mean, like for example, yeah, yeah, like you said, the last, um, like when I saw the French startup, um, AEDCIS. Oh, so that's example, okay. I, I think we don't have to, I mean, we don't need to have a, experience of it. I mean, even if we don't know too much about mathematical morphology, I think it's uh, it's made for almost everyone, like, uh, and also for very many different applications. So I think it's uh, good to use. Uh, I think there is also there are other tools. So like, for example, um, uh, I think it's called uh, MorphoJLib. I don't know if, uh, Teresa, maybe you know more about this. Okay. Well, uh, the failure it's a software you can you can buy it and you can use it without uh, no any to, without knowing nothing about mathematical morphology tools and you, you can also programming so the using interface is a very complete program you can use okay. it but it's very specific too um, there is uh, other software uh, that can that now they start using some mathematical morphology tools such as ENVI for land observation, heart observation also. Uh, there is another one, ILVIS, they, they start using some operators, some mathematical morphology operators to, to okay. use in several applications. But uh, and there is an, and there is some also I don't know the name but there are also two softwares one of uh, of them is free for free use you can you can ask uh, and you can use it without knowing nothing but you need to request I can I can uh, <laughs> do some research about it and send to to that's to good yeah I I was talking to Joanna about uh, you know after the the webinar maybe we can. Um, somehow collect some of this information and somehow provide it to if people want to to know more because since the, the, the seminar is being recorded maybe someone watches it later it would be nice to have a few links that they can follow afterwards with with those types of uh, information but maybe we'll send you an email later today is asking for those things yes yes i, I can organize this with uh, with slava and we next time uh, that i will meet, meet with slava we can ask and uh, we can i'm sorry we can rearrange this uh, yeah. information okay it's good and to keep this record of uh yeah, you know, so that someone later finds this yeah, and yes. uh, it has something some follow-up tips because if you know it's a very expensive software but uh, there are some there they um, the software is very strong for medical applications yeah and but i was so looking at affiliate and it only runs on expensive. windows it doesn't run on a mac so that's why I was thinking of other uh, alternatives. And, but, uh, but there are other real softwares. Uh, yeah. Not so okay. Quickly, but you can uh, you can use it and you can programming of course in MATLAB or also in GitHub. I think in Python. Thanks. Okay. Very nice. Very very nice work, Slava. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So does anyone uh, has any questions? Well, I think that um, I just have to say that it's it's a very interesting work, Slava. So, uh, congratulations, and it's very important uh, to see the different applications. Well, I just have to share some something here. Um, 
So I believe you're all seeing. So uh, next week we are going to have this masterclass. So uh, if you want to share it with uh, anyone, uh, would be interesting because uh, this is important because we already have this um, the is a big uh, open call. These are the deadlines, and also we already have uh, opened the Spark for Business call. So. If you want, uh, be with us on uh, on the 8th of February or share it with uh, with anyone. Um, and I think that's it. I just have to thank everyone to be here and um, for being here. And um, that's it. Thank you, Slava. Thank you. Thank you, Slava. Thank you, Joana.